my name is Alexandria French, and today I will delineate the espionage case of Harry Dexter White through this presentation, adhering to the outline set forth in the following agenda. Thank you for your attention, and I hope you enjoy White's bizarre, chaotic story, as well as discover the questionable Soviet informant's continued overwhelming impact on the United States intelligence community today. I will begin by presenting the case's main facts and their overwhelming significance to the United States intelligence community before delving into White's personal background, specifically his upbringing, education, and employment, and how such circumstances led to White's ultimate betrayal of the United States government. Next, I will recount the exact information compromised to the adversary intelligence service by White, as well as detail the class of tradecraft he employed in this act of espionage. Finally, the presentation will review White's identification and apprehension by the United States government in addition to appraising the final disposition of this unique espionage case study by detailing its fully comprehensive proceedings, or rather, lack thereof. Overall, the following presentation endeavors to educate those outside of the intelligence community on the gravity of renegades within the world's most secure nation. Traitors operatives cause lasting residual effects on the United States national security and threaten the well-being of its impressive intelligence community. However, rather than allow emissaries to diminish the quality of national and international intelligence services produced by the United States, our intelligence community utilizes cases such as Harry Dexter White's as heuristic teaching methods that sharpen our overall facilities further extend our already overwhelming capacities, and provide a highly sophisticated labyrinth untouchable by our foreign adversaries. Harry Dexter White's role and complicity in the Communist conspiracy during the Bretton Woods Conference and the formation of the International Monetary Fund is one of the most heavily disputed topics in the intelligence community. However, whether his compliance was knowledgeable or ignorant is besides the point. Of utmost importance is that private U.S. intelligence was compromised and history shaped from the circumstances crafted by White's decisions within the U.S. Treasury Department. Specifically, White personally engaged in a multitude of inappropriate meetings with high-ranking Soviet intelligence officials, passed along sensitive information to Soviet informants, and allowed a U.S. Soviet intelligence ring, the Silvermaster Group, to operate within the U.S. Treasury Department. White was known for his commitment to a symbiotic world order and believed that the U.S. government could help achieve this with anti-fascist and pro-Soviet policies. It was this context in history that made Harry Dexter White's case significant to the U.S. intelligence community. An analysis of White's acts without understanding the economic, political, and social background is counterproductive. Though global turbulence was high and not all acts inimical to American interests connected to espionage charges, White's case is certainly an outlier. The Bretton Woods International Trading Contravance, White's greatest achievement, was a clever artifice that allowed the United States dollar to not only stabilize, but also become the dominant reserve currency within the world economy. Most historians and intelligence officials debate today over whether this outcome was intended because of its fundamental basis in liberal capitalism, or because White structured it to function inherently as a pro-Soviet contortion. In the end, the ultimate fall of the Soviet Union sanctioned a monumental U.S. rise to global dominance, which approbated liberal internationalism and liberated debt-ridden states by fully renouncing the gold standard. On one hand, the collapse, along with White's fatal heart attack a year after Bretton Woods' success and the successive forge of the international monetary system, prevented further investigation of the Soviet Union and White's communist agenda. On the other, the world may be better off if it remains oblivious to the Russian espionage apparatus. White was born in Boston, Massachusetts on October 9, 1892 of Lithuanian immigrants Isaac and Sarah White. As a child, White worked for his father at the family's hardware business until he enlisted in the army to serve in France during World War I. After returning from overseas, White began his university career at Columbia before later transferring to Stanford. He received his Bachelor of Arts in Economics in 1924 and his Master's the following year. Because of his successful studies and work ethic, White was invited to continue his education and pursue Harvard's economic doctoral program in 1926. For the next six years, he taught as an instructor while he completed his studies. He was awarded his doctorate in 1930. White enjoyed teaching and became a professor at a small college until the Great Depression rendered him unemployed. Once President Franklin Delano Roosevelt was elected, White uprooted and moved to Washington to pursue more rigorous economic works. 
1934, White became a member of the Brain Trust Department of Economics within the United States Treasury, who were tasked with implementing President Roosevelt's New Deal policies. White specifically worked on analyzing the economic consequences of the Gold Reserve Act and was successful enough in this temporary summer assignment that he was granted a permanent position at the Treasury. White remained employed at the Treasury for the next 12 years. Eventually, he rose to the rank of Assistant Secretary, or the U.S. Treasury's Chief Economist, and reported to Secretary Henry Morgenthau, Jr. In 1946, President Harry Truman appointed White as the U.S. Executive Director of the International Monetary Fund, but White withdrew within the year after suffering from his first heart attack. White then worked as a freelance consultant for foreign governments until he succumbed to his second heart attack on August 16, 1948. White's personal and professional lives must be integrated in order to rationalize the driving forces behind his disloyalty to the United States government. If separated, the extensive social picture of White's pervasive corruption unavoidably dissolves. The Harvard-trained economist was a confidant whose efforts were vested by powerful political figures of the United States government, namely President Roosevelt and Secretary Morgenthau. White proposed the multilateral trading system, now known as the Bretton Woods Conference, to both the President and the Secretary, beside the ideas of John Maynard Keynes. Together, Keynes and White negotiated the architectural of the International Monetary Fund, whose articles of agreement were approved by 44 national delegations in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire on July 22, 1944, with the international organization entering into force from 29 additional signatures only months later on December 27. White's uncanny relationship with communism and the Soviet Union was alive before the conference, especially during the five months prior to the article's approval in late July. White was knowingly involved in a series of meetings in Washington with high-profile Soviet delegates. These secluded gatherings were intended to produce efficient abutment from the USSR towards the Bretton Woods system by way of explaining the benefits of cooperation in responding to Soviet apprehension regarding the enterprise's capitalist attributes. These meetings were successful, and the Soviet delegation were one of the 44 countries who initially signed the Articles of Agreement in July, until Joseph Stalin withdrew shortly before the IMF's enforcement in December because of his fear of U.S. dominance. All in all, the meetings described were not simply meant to calm concerns or preach the benefits of White's proposal, but to negotiate associate involvement. These negotiations, alongside other allegations, ultimately amounted to espionage and were clearly motivated by White's admiration of the Soviet's own economic system. The two economists, Keynes and White, crusaded against one another in negotiations on behalf of their respective countries' national interest. Arguments were strained and volatile, but produced a powerful synergism that the global community had yet to experience. During the core of World War II, the world's most brilliant economic intellectuals, coupled with their dynamic and immensely potent states, clashed to create the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. White in the United States occupied the advantage because the U.S. held most of the world's gold reserves and was an accepted and even celebrated part of our country. The Roosevelt administration pushed an agenda for an absolute and expeditious opening of world trade and finance. The U.S. sought to siphon through markets previously untouchable due to the British orbit. The United Kingdom, on the other hand, fought desperately to cradle its faltering empire, along with imperialistic trade policies that forced an area of countries to peg British sterling to gold. Throughout the negotiations, White succeeded in implementing key momentous facets of the new institution's design that were imperative to continued U.S. success. White's preparations had been carefully crafted over the three years prior to the Bretton Woods Conference, and his time investment succeeded. White and Keynes eventually agreed on White's basic plan for an international stabilization fund, which sought to quell financial turbulence from ever-shifting exchange rates through fixing foreign countries' currency to the U.S. dollar, which would be subsequently fixed to the price of gold. The resulting fund would lend U.S. dollars and eventually other currencies convertible to the price of gold to indebted nations throughout arduous terms. Lending, however, would pale in comparison to the open multilateral trading system that the IMF would painstakingly forge. With White's economic framework and Keynes' conscientious suggestions, the scholarly player reconciled their joint plan at the Bretton Woods Conference. The most central element of the infant institution was the creation of an avenue capable of stabilizing exchange rates and prices that would, in turn, generate substantial economic growth around the world. As the world's modern economy provides, this concept materialized in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, just three days after the D-Day landings on the beaches of Normandy, drew World War II to a swift and necessary conclusion. The gold standard was to be abolished through diminishing the international role of gold over time through the U.S. dollar sacrifice of fixed currency. 
Gold had become too inflexible, and there were too many unpredictable and capricious changes in its supply, meaning that nations would either prosper or suffer on the luck of finding gold, rather than their, through their skills and economic development. Such development would be fostered through the IMF's new system of cooperative management of money by central banks within each member state which would in turn cultivate financial stability, multilateral collaboration, and post-war economic reconstruction. These positives would multiply upon one another, as was predicted and realized because the success of the conference led to a previously unmatched state of world peace through the promises of prosperity. Naturally, states had to forfeit many of their own national interests in order to advance to the new world order, but their yields proved fruitful as international trade flourished and globalization began to surge to unprecedented levels. No longer did nationalist economies prohibit the promise of global trade as they had through both world wars. Today, the International Monetary Fund is the very centerpiece of the post-war international financial system, and it continues to progress today. Understanding why its influence on building today's advanced society from the broken fragments of the global community after two world wars should not be extenuated. However, White's character has spoiled his reputation, which has been thoroughly upon and contradicted. The Bretton Woods system itself has been somewhat tarnished and is often characterized as pro-Soviet despite its fundamentally capitalist nature. The U.S. government and its intelligence community is still unsure of the amount of compromised intelligence White ceded to the Soviet Union. What we do know is that White's reverence for Soviet assiduity was based in a lost faith in capitalism during his own personal struggles throughout the Great Depression. His belief in communism's intrinsic morality and his ability to turn a blind eye and deaf ear to mass Soviet atrocities. As aforementioned, White's complicity along with his incongruous negotiations and meetings with the most prominent members of Soviet society was enough to charge him with treason. More incriminating, however, was White's role in what has become known as Operation Snow, Snow meaning White. White brought about the day of infamy by wrenching peace talks between Japan and the U.S. through an ultimatum adopted as official policy by President Roosevelt that increased belligerent military attacks by the U.S. on Japan. The Soviet Union, during this time, were anxious that Japan would attack the Kremlin, so they employed their spy networks in order to ensure Japan would strike the U.S. rather than the USSR. The ultimatum, known as the Ten Point Note, was the indisputable cause of Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor. Subsequently, the U.S. entered into World War II, which some argue ended the Great Depression by initiating a process of economic recovery. Less ambiguous is the tradecraft utilized by White during his espionage campaign. The term tradecraft and intelligence refers to the methods, techniques, and technology employed by a secret agent. According to witness reports and declassified U.S. documents, White was outlined by USSR as, quote, the most important member of the Silver Master Network and the most highly placed asset the Soviets possessed in the American government, end quote. White's assistance compromised a wide array of techniques, such as updating his co-conspirators through oral briefs, negotiations, and meetings, or when unable to attend in person, exchanging secure messages through handwritten summaries. White also procured secret information from the U.S. Treasury Department and passed it along his chain of command. Moreover, this position allowed him to utilize his political and social standing to employ communists, cover from mistakes of the Silver Master Group, and push unknowing individuals into accepting deals that would ultimately benefit the Soviet Union. Additionally, White routinely exposed U.S. diplomatic positions before key international conferences, which allowed the Soviet Union to advance their own agendas because of the awareness of U.S. priorities beforehand. In one instance, White caused the complete financial destabilization of Germany when he convinced the U.S. Treasury to confer the plates and information necessary to print the new Germany currency, known as Allied Marks, in East Germany. The Soviets then overproduced East Germany Marks, while the U.S. carefully regulated Marks in the destitute Western Germany. Eventually, the entire economy was on the verge of collapse and had to be entirely reformed by the United States. The USSR responded with the Berlin blockade of 1948 and 1949. The only records of White's tradecraft, which will be expanded upon in the next slide, are two witness accounts in the Verona decryptions. Within these decryptions, White is never mentioned under his own name, but by several pseudonyms. At first, White was known as Reed, then Richard, as he climbed up the political ladder of communism espionage with the United States as well as within the Treasury Department, and finally, as jurist. The mention of these names began in 1941 and picked up speed abruptly ending around the same time of White's second and fatal heart attack. No active mention of the pseudonyms followed White's death, leaving license for speculation. White first fell under the U.S. Federal Bureau of Investigation Surveillance in 1946, investigated by J. Edgar Hoover, the FBI director himself. 
Hoover suspected White of being a Soviet spy and prepared a report for the president, which was compiled from 30 independent sources. Not wanting to cause scandal and damage to the reputation of the new IMF, Washington ultimately decided against placing White as the institution's managing director, instead of offering him the role of executive director. Other powerful names, such as that of Representative Richard M. Nixon, questioned White's loyalty. In 1950, Nixon revealed a handwritten memo from White, which had been addressed to the Soviet Union and given to him by communist defector Whitaker Chambers. White's guilt, however, remained a highly controversial subject for the next half century until the Venona Cables were published in the late 1990s. Before the Venona decrypts were discovered and unclassified, the sole source of espionage allegation towards White was from two communist defectors. After the conclusion of World War II and the IMF's enforcement, two informants notified the FBI and later the public that White was a spy for the Soviets. The House Committee on Un-American Activities, or HCUA, hearings during the summer of 1948 saw Elizabeth Bentley and Whitaker Chambers give testimony. Bentley, a former member of the Silvermaster Group, accused White of being an agent of influence for the Soviet Union while he was employed at the U.S. Treasury. She linked White to the Silvermaster Group through individuals that had conveyed sensitive Treasury documents to members of the Soviet intelligence. The confessed spy also claimed that, quote, White was a valuable adjunct to an underground Soviet espionage organization who was placing individuals of high regard to Soviet intelligence inside the government, end quote. Chambers, a Time Magazine journalist and member of the U.S. Communist Party, produced the Pumpkin Papers in 1948, which suggested that White occasionally transmitted information to the Soviets. Chambers claimed that the papers were given to him directly by White to convey to Soviet intelligence, but his testimony did not reach the grand jury. Still, Chambers alleges that White was a source for the Soviet military intelligence network and that White provided information through oral lectures and handwritten papers. Overall, Chambers describes White as a Soviet sympathizer, who was mostly undisciplined and did not take orders, but still cooperated with the Communist Party underground. Skepticism was heightened further when it was revealed that White had several acquaintances within the U.S. Communist Party. One particular subordinate supplied a treasury documents drafted by White that were previously conveyed to the Silvermaster Group. White's association with and complicity towards the large cell of American spies who existed within the U.S. Treasury immediately renders him guilty by association. Additionally, more than two dozen KJB documents spanning 1941 to 1948 spell out his assistance to Soviet intelligence. Finally, the Venona Cables, which were intercepted by the U.S. government in the 1940s, partially decrypted and translated into a project contained, quote, damning evidence against White, end quote. Over 15 cables referenced White through his pseudonyms, and reports from it revealed Soviet intelligence agents confirm White's involvement in espionage. At least two of the cables document improper discussions of American foreign policy between White and the Soviet case officer known only as Kolstov, while others cite White as an agent, associate, or hoodwink. Lastly, the most notorious and peculiar intercept was addressed to White's wife from the Silvermaster Group's head, Nathan Gregory Silvermaster, and arranging funding for their daughter's university tuition. In early 1948, White suffered his first heart attack that caused him to withdraw his position from the International Monetary Fund. That summer, during the HCUA testimonies, White requested five to ten minutes of rest for each hour of testimony. He succumbed to his second and final heart attack immediately after completing his own personal testimony, where he denied his role in any and all involvement on August 16, 1948. Needless to say, Harry Dexter White was never apprehended by U.S. government authorities, nor held accountable for his actions involving the USSR. Unfortunately, there is no convincing explanation for White's guilt, just as there are no clarifications for his actions, even upon setting them into context. The evidence provided by association, informants, and the Venona cables are more than circumstantial evidence of White's inappropriate contact with the Soviet Union, but not enough to place blame or declare evidence. The links at which White went to protect communists in the U.S. suggest that he was not as naive to Soviet espionage as he had claimed to be in his final testimony. White's story is a key figure in the Bretton Woods system and the creation of the post-World War II economic order is considered part and parcel of history of Soviet espionage operations during and after World War II. The media and national newspapers claim Soviet espionage was everywhere in the U.S. and historians still claim that this spying forever damaged our country. American spies turned Soviet informants were particularly the most dangerous, and in fact, the most major of espionage crimes were committed by Americans in high positions of trust, such as White, but also including names such as Hiss, Vice Band, and the Rosenbergs. Therefore, Soviet success relied on its ability to turn agents rather than plant them. The following resources comprise two categories. 
In the first section, I have outlined the specific resources I have used to gather my analysis of Harry Dexter White's espionage case. In the second, I have provided additional resources for further study for those of you that are interested in advancing your knowledge of the United States intelligence community and its reactions to internal espionage during the Cold War and World War II eras. Please feel free to take advantage of these resources, as well as provide your own in the comment section below. Thank you for your attention during this presentation. I hope that you have found it has provided sufficient detail into the importance of espionage cases, such as whites, in improving the resilience of the U.S. intelligence community. As stated by the United States Central Intelligence Agency, history is complex, and when history goes badly, it is not ipso facto the result of sabotage or betrayal. The problem with this approach, however, is that sometimes it runs up against contravening evidence.